It begins with words. In the beginning was the word, and our stories begin with words. Our writing begins and ends and begins again with words. Words are the medium of a writer's craft. If you want to be a painter, you learn to see color, color, to hold a brush, to sweep across a canvas. If you want to be a musician, you learn to hear notes, to hold an instrument, to play its parts until the song comes. And if you want to be a writer, you don't learn to, but you already love words. You know the power they hold over you, but you yearn to learn how to make that power yield to yours. Those who love words begin not by giving them away, but first by storing them up. Lovers of words read. And it should go without saying, but it doesn't. More and more today. If you want to write, you must read. Read the words everywhere. In books, in the Bible, on billboards, on cereal boxes, on blog posts, in newspapers and magazines and newsletters, in poetry and drama and novels and short stories. Oh, in textbooks too, yeah. Before all else, writers are lovers of words. So I'm going to spend the first part of this talk talking about reading. I know, that's disappointing. You just want to learn about the writing. Um, but this is the first part of writing and the talk. If you aren't already a voracious reader, I hope to woo you into being one. And if you are, then this will all just be music to your ears. So then after that, in the second half, I'll talk more about writing, um, some of the practicalities, the varieties of writing, and why ultimately, as the title of this talk suggests, why you should add your words, your story, to this word-laden world. Reading. Reading is one of the few distinctively human activities that sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. As many scholars have noted, reading, unlike spoken language, does not come naturally to us. It must be taught. Because it goes beyond mere biology, there is something profoundly spiritual. However one understands that word, I mean, this is sort of a, I mean, any, you don't even have to be a believer to understand this. There's something profoundly spiritual about the human ability, the impulse to read. In fact, even the various um, senses in which we use that word, read, captures um, so, many of what it, so much of what it means to be human. Because to read, on one level, means just to be able to decipher a given and learned set of symbols in a mechanistic way. You know, if, if you speak one language, you learn one alphabet. Um, if, you, if it's another, it's another. Some of you are learning a few of those alphabets right now. But the word read also suggests something else. It suggests the very human act of finding meaning, of interpreting, in the sense in which we might say we are reading a situation or reading a person. To read in this sense might be considered one of the most spiritual of all human activities. And it is spiritual reading, not merely decoding the words on the page, that unleashes the power that good literature has to reach into our souls, and in so doing, to draw and connect us to others. This is why the way we read can be even more important, actually I think is more important, than what we read. In fact, reading good literature won't make a better reader a better person any more than sitting in a church or any other um, place or sitting in a school will make them a better Christian or a better student. It's not just sitting there. But reading good books well might make us better. As Eugene Peterson explains in his book, Eat This Book, quote, reading is an immense gift, but only if the words are assimilated, taken into the soul, eaten, chewed, gnawed, received in unhurried delight. P 
Peterson describes this ancient art of Lectio Divina, Divina or spiritual reading, as, quote, reading that enters our souls as food enters our, sub our stomachs, spreads through our blood, and becomes love and wisdom, end quote. This power of spiritual reading is its ability to transcend the immediacy of the material, the moment, or even a particular choice at hand. More than the books themselves, it is the skills and the desire to read in this way which comprises the essential gift we must give ourselves uh, and our readers if we become writers. But this doesn't happen, either the reading or writing, by way of nature or accident. Marianne Wolf, who's director of the Center for Reading and Language uh, Research and author of a couple of uh, excellent books, Proust and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain, and a little more recently, Reader Come Home, has studied this phenomenon called deep reading in the context of the science of the brain. She describes the fragility of the brain's ability to read with the kind of sustained attention that allows literature to wield its shaping power over us. I'm gonna read a quote from her and then talk a little bit more about that. This is uh, from Wolf. The act of going beyond the text to analyze, infer, and think new thoughts is the product of years of formation. It takes time, both in milliseconds and years, an effort to learn to read with deep, expanding comprehension and to execute all these processes as an adult expert reader. Because we literally and physiologically can read in multiple ways, how we read and what we absorb from our reading will be influenced by both the content of our reading and the medium we use. That's Wolf. To translate that in my own words, um, I will say, Twitter is making us dumber. <laughs> um, and I am a heavy Twitter user, so. Um, but seriously, um, our, if, you feel, if you feel like you've had the experience of your brain reading differently uh, when you are spending time on social media and then it, when you switch over to an actual book, even just like 10 or 15 minutes in a book, you, it just something happens to your brain that you can feel. Um, and there's lots and lots of cognitive science on this. So just, and we can, we call it all reading and it is reading. Um, but they are, what Wolf is saying is they are not the same activity. They are not the same. And we have to cultivate our skills in the, in the deeper, more spiritual reading. Um, I have a lot to say about that. Um, and there are lots of books about that. And if I have time for questions and answers here, we'll, I'll, I'll expand on it. And, and I have another session at the end. Um, so that's just sort of kind of trying to whet your appetite for reading in general. I want to talk a little bit about the different genres of reading and how they work differently. Um, and I don't know what all of you as potential or already writers are interested in writing, so hopefully I'll hit some notes um, that are of interest to you. So I'm going to start with fiction, which is the kind of reading that I love most and which has um, formed me the most, and I think my character as a person and even as, as a writer, um, even though I don't write fiction um, yet, I don't know if I ever will, but I just, it still helps me write what I do write. And uh, in my first book, I think was mentioned in the introduction, um, Booked Literature in the Soul of Me, which is a spiritual and literary memoir. Um, I recount the way the books that I read um, as a girl, as a young woman, um, as a student later, how all of those books just shaped me in so many ways, shaped my worldview, shaped my character, my beliefs, um, as much as anything else. So for example, from Great Expectations, one of my favorites, I learned the power that stories have um, to the stories that we tell ourselves, um, how they can do us either good or harm uh, to ourselves or others. From Death of a Salesman, I learned the dangers of a corrupt version of the American dream. From Madame Bovary, I learned to embrace the real world, the ordinary world, rather than choosing to flight, escape into flights of fancy. From Gulliver's Travels, I learned the profound limitations of my own finite perspective. 
and from Jane Eyre, another of my favorites. They're all my favorites, okay? Let's be honest. And from Jane Eyre, I learned how to be myself. And these weren't merely intellectual lessons or moral lessons. There are a lot of ways we can talk about these books that way. And, and they, they do have those lessons. Um, and the lessons that I learned may have begun that way. But rather, the stories from these books and so many others became part of my life story and then gradually just part of my soul. Stories take place in linear time. And in that way, they imitate our sense of our earthly existence, which also has a beginning and a middle and an end. And even stories that play with linear time um, do that while rooted in it. I mean, they are not playing against it unless they know what it is. And the heart of every story, every good story, even a three sentence long story, and there are such examples, flash fi fiction or short, short, short fiction, um, the heart of every story is a conflict. Without conflict and the events that lead to it and follow it, there really is no story. There's just a series of events or a list, list of events. Um, there's a famous one is often attributed to Ernest Hemingway, but that's like a literary myth. I don't know where it came from. I don't think anyone knows, but now see, I'm not good at retelling these and it's not in, um, but it's something like for sale, baby shoes never worn. That's a story, <laughs> a sad story, but it's a story. Like there's something happened, right? Something horrible happened. It doesn't tell us what it is, but. Um, there's a conflict. And just as in stories where the uh, conflict is at the center, um, that is the same for our own lives, for conflict lies at the heart of the ultimate story of human existence, creation, fall, redemption. Um, and the essential human conflict is, of course, the rupture of our union with God. So stories any good story, um, embody truth in a way that parallels these theological truths as well as um, the other truth of, of the incarnation of Christ uh, in that stories sort of make concrete or make tangible and material um, spiritual and transcendent truths. So that's just a little bit to whet your appetite about fiction. Um, probably the least favorite sort of literary genre, especially today, or you might think it's the least um, favorite, but it is around us more than we realize, is poetry. So as the form of literature that uses language and words in the most condensed fashion, poetry actually magnifies the same power that all literary art has happens to the best of us. <laughs> That's all right. Speaking of poetry. <laughs> so if you've ever experienced the power of a word, just one word or a sentence or a phrase, then you've actually experienced the power of poetry. Um, because all literature, all literary art does what poetry does. Poetry just does it in a much more condensed way. So you might think that you are not a poetry person, but I'm here to try to convince you in a short time that you are. So if you've actually just had that thrill that we all experience um, when we make a new connection, you've experienced the power of poetry. Because poetry... Um, does the same thing. Poetry makes connections through words. Um, that's all figures of speech, all those ones that you learn in, in junior high or high school, and then again in college, metaphor, simile, metonymy, synecdoche, allusion, all of those. All of those are just different ways that we use words to show how one thing is like another. That's all it is, is saying how things are alike. A poem suggests more than its words say through the power of these kinds of connections or comparisons. A rush of meaning overspills the banks of its words to be scooped up by a reader's pitiful little cup. 
if you're reading a great poem, I think that's, you just know that it's overflowing with meaning and all you can do, it's like a river rushing by and you have a little tin cup and you just dip it in and try to get a little bit. And something I often say when I'm teaching works of poetry, well, any works of poetry, but especially the really hard ones like T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, for example, um, is just if you get 10% of this poem, it, you have gotten far, far more than you would get 100% of most of what you see out there. Um, uh, on social media or even in, even in a lot of books and so forth. You know, some books are not that good. So just to get a little bit of something great is powerful. The tools of poetry forge links. Comparisons are made, as I said, with similes and metaphors. Patterns are established with rhythms, meters, and sounds. Associations are offered through rhymes, repetitions, and images. Poetry relates eye to word, sense to sound, mind to matter, and, in the words of my beloved Flannery O'Connor, mystery to manner. Here's one example um, taken from the famous opening lines of a very traditional poem by the Scottish pro poet Robert Burns. It's a very, seems like a very simple sing-songy poem. You might have heard it. If you've ever heard it, you can hardly forget it. Um, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Pretty simple. But the density of the simple language and imagery in the poem, once released, reveals a treasure hoard of connections. I'm going to read it again just to kind of, it's only four lines. There's a lot in there. And this isn't the whole poem. My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So, little poetry lesson here. So my love, my love could be my feelings, but it could be, oh, my love, my, this person, right? I mean, right? You, do, you don't know. It could be either one because, because the, those two words suggest both equally. Um, and the rose, the rose isn't just any rose. It's a red rose, and not just any red rose, but a red, red rose, right? And what a difference that makes. I mean, a red, red rose is something else besides a red rose, right? Trust me. I don't know. <laughs> and June connects this love, whether it's the emotion or the beloved, to both the freshness of spring, as does the word later, um, sprung, right? It's newly sprung in June, like automatically sprung, we connect to spring. And, um, and of course, June is the matrimonial season. And the rhyming with, of June with tune bring harmony to the poem that's suggested already in that, in that fourth line about being sweetly played in tune. I mean, the, what good poets like this do is make it look really, really easy. Um, but like, I could never have done all this with like 20 words. Um, so, the, so the June and the tune bring harmony to the melody that is so like this love, and a song that's not just played in tune, but sweetly played in tune, right? Because there are a lot of ways you can play a song in tune, but sweetly is one way. So all of these words, all of these connections that the words make with each other or with their, the words that we automatically think of in relation to them um, reinforces the whole sense of the passage. The meaning arises not just from the words, but from the connections that we, the poet, uh, makes us make, <laughs> or invites us to make, or uh, allows us to make, or expects us to make, and and that's where it gets a little bit slippery because maybe you know, if, you know, we we don't have all of the connections that he might have. Um, now that I live in. Virginia, I don't necessarily associate June with spring. Um, <laughs> that's more like March or April. Um, but, you know, so there can be little differences, but it's still the matrimonial season. But all of those connections that we make arise from the words, the sounds, the rhythms, and the rhymes, um, and even, you know, as I've already suggested, bringing in our own world of experience and knowledge, even with, I mean, this is like one of the most, the simplest um, canonical poems that I could think of, and there's a lot there. So why poetry? Um, and I encourage you all, if you're trying to increase your attention span or your 
vocabulary or your reading ability, all that. Poetry is like the best way to do that. Just read. You don't have to sit and read poetry all day, but you can read a poem or two a night. Um, and it really helps all of your language skills. Because poetry is the tie that binds. It binds likeness to likeness, word to music, image to sensation. While the rest of the world divides and derides, pushes away and pushes apart, confronts and affronts, poetry brings together. While the world spots differences, poetry seeks semblances. It weaves a fractured, fallen world back together, word by word. It gathers up scattered pieces of brokenness and glues them back together again, like a cracked china cup in which meaning is served to overflowing. And I am, in this talk, eventually getting to kind of writing, you know, sharing your story with words. So I want to give you an example of another poem written in 1926 by the African-American poet Langston Hughes as a response to a more famous, or then more famous poem by Walt Whitman, I Hear America Singing, um, written a century before. So Whitman is a famous American poet of the 19th century, wrote this poem, I Hear America Singing, 1926, part of the Harlem Renaissance. Langston Hughes writes this poem as a response. And it's not just a poem, it's not just a response. It's also his story. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. Now, many of you are here are probably, maybe you're like me, and you don't consider yourselves to be writers of fiction or poetry. Maybe you do, I, I'm, I'm not. But desire instead, um, like me, to share ideas, opinions, analysis, um, views, hot takes. <laughs> whether in blogs or newspapers, magazines, journals, whatever it might be. Even academic journals are um, this form, the essays. And so I have to admit that while I've written a few books, um, the essay really has always been and remains my favorite genre. Um, Michel de Montaigne, the French essayist of uh, the Renaissance, adopted the word essay, uh, which in French, essay means to try. So an essay was literally like something like to try or test something, to, to put an idea on trial. Um, and this is what the essay really does with ideas. It just tries them. Um, Samuel Johnson, an 18th century essayist and critic, called the essay, um, Johnson's the best, a loose sally of the mind. I like that. <laughs> Aldous Huxley in the 19th century called the essay a literary device for saying almost everything about almost anything. But one article that gives a sort of more, you know, uh, distinct uh, dictionary kind of definition uh, describes an essay formally as a short work of nonfiction, often artfully disordered and highly polished, in which an authorial voice invites an implied reader to accept as authentic a certain textual mode of experience. Or a loose sally of the mind, I guess. <laughs> um, the famous essayist and memorist Annie Dillard, um, who write, you know, she writes a lot of things, but um, primarily the essay, says this, and I agree with her. The essay can do everything a poem can do and everything a short story can do, everything but fake it. The essayist does what we do with our lives, the essayist thinks about actual things. He can make sense of them analytically or artistically. In either case, he renders the real world coherent and meaningful, even if only bits of it, and even if that coherence and meaning reside only inside small texts. I like that. Um, 
And again, when we, we do the question, question and answer, either now or later, I'm happy to talk more about any of these. Um, memoir is the next genre that I want to write about. Um, because for some of you, the most powerful words that you have to share may be the most personal ones. And those uh, words may be the ones that tell about your life. And I, you know, I've given a whole workshop on memoir, which I'm not doing um, here today, but just you know, to, just to set it out there, memoir is not the same as autobiography. Autobiography tries to sort of tell most everything. And a memoir is really um, kind of a slice of life, kind of an angle um, with a theme, with an overarching theme, which is why it tends to be more literary and fits in the in a genre that um, writing instructors call creative nonfiction or CNF, um, because it is considered an art form. Um, consider, uh, no, 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 I've skipped. Uh, so writing a memoir um, is very vulnerable, obviously. And uh, often you'll hear writing teachers or memoir teachers compare it to taking off your clothes in public, which is pretty vulnerable. Uh, but I, one writing coach responds to that old cliche by saying that it doesn't go far enough. It's like taking your clothes off and reading your journal in public at the same time. Right? So, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, I have a lot to say about memoir because I've written one. Um, but let's consider this story for a moment. I'm just giving a shortened version of it. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. When she was eight years old, she was taken from the grandmother who had raised her in Arkansas to St. Louis to live with her mother, with the mother who had long ago abandoned her. And there in St. Louis, the little girl was brutally raped by her mother's boyfriend. And although the rapist was soon after tried and found guilty, he was allowed to go free. Because who in the St. Lewis court system in 1930 cared about a poor little black girl, after all. When the girl's family and community sought justice and ended up murdering the rapist, the little girl blamed herself for his death. She thought she should have remained quiet. So as a result, she shut her mouth and never spoke for a long, long time. Only after she was in introduced to books and words and all the worlds they reveal did the girl eventually find her voice. Her name is Maya Angelou. And she is the girl who wrote this story of her life. I know why the caged bird sings. And the world has ever since been enriched and educated and changed by her words. But she had to find her voice and those words first. Yet a life doesn't need to be dramatic to be interesting. Um, the, the key, especially in a memoir, is to reveal the universal through the particular. The good memoir is honest without being therapy or confession. Now, therapists exist for therapy. Priests and the Lord for confession. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that, that's, that is not what a memoir is for. Um, a memoir is interesting to read, or a journal, or a journal. That's something I often say. Like, a lot of, lot of writing I see should just stay in a journal um, <laughs> with a lock and a key. <laughs> um, but a memoir can be interesting to readers, not because you reveal yourself as much as because you reveal something to them about themselves through your experiences. Again, that's finding the universal and the particular. Um, but of course, there, you know, there are also um, some memoirs uh, or some lives that really are curious and different enough to make for fascinating uh, memoirs. And I'll, I just, people often ask me what my favorite memoirs are, and so I'll t say those here. Um, Tara Westover's Educated and Jeanette Wall's The Glass Castle. Um, and what I love most about The Glass Castle, Educated isn't as is good in this area, but... Um, the Glass Castle is, is the story of a girl who was you know, really mistreated by her family and grew up in rough circumstances. And yet, she doesn't, pardon the expression, throw her family under the bus. Um, 
she is loving toward them and understanding as much, you know, kind of navigating that truth in love. Um, and that's a really powerful part of the book to me that she could undergo so much and yet try to be, show grace um, to her family. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're looking to read something that you might follow an example from, um, I would recommend that. So because literature embodies the, uh, the linearity, as I talked about before, and the connectivity of our conflict-ridden lives, reading, whether it's novels, short stories, poems, essays, or memoirs, is practice in making meaning out of the human condition. Metaphorically, stories, drama, and poetry put flesh on ideas so those ideas can dwell among us. Good writing expands the imagination, not only by enlarging our field of vision beyond the limits of our finite experience, but also in help, help, helping us to practice finding and making meaning. But with so many good stories already in the world, does the world need any more? That's the question. And I say, yes. I say that because the universe is infinite. And because the God who created the world with his words and created us in the image of his word, I say the world will never run out of room for more words. But, and there's always a but, and I'll have more of those buts later at the end of the day when I talk about some of the perils of publishing. Um, words can be good and they can be bad. They can be life-giving or they can be life-destroying. They can increase the beauty of the world or merely add to the noise. And we have so much noise. Words, like the rest of God's good gifts, should be stewarded well. So how do we go about stewarding this great gift? Well, I think I've already made the case for most of the, this talk, um, is that when talking about literature and reading, is that writing is an art that uses words. It's an, you know, we all have words, we use words, we read them, we speak them. So sometimes, you know, we think that's, that we're already equipped to write well. But I can't dribble a, a basketball just because I can walk, <laughs> right? I don't know if that's the best analogy, but, you know, <laughs> I can hold a ball, I can walk, maybe, but that, you know, but that doesn't allow me to, to dribble a basketball. Um, I can listen to music, but I can't sing it. Okay. <laughs> so writing is an art form. Words just happen to be its medium. So writing and this is the hardest point to make, especially to a Christian audience. Writing is not just about ideas. We love our ideas, don't we? Not just Christians, but Christians especially. We love to you know, think that we have the truth that's going to save the world, and all we have to do is say it. Um, and which that's I'm um, you know that 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 works right I mean that can work but when we're talking about writing as a craft writing as an art form writing that deserves to be published and deserves and warrants some other person meaning a publisher investing in it which we'll talk about later um, means that you, it, it has to be an art form or something that you have practice and have skill at um, it's a craft so and to be sure writing always communicates ideas. Um, but so do commercials, Facebook posts, memes, texts, jokes, and billboards. They all convey ideas. Um, good writing is a craft whose tool is words. Just as a woodworker knows how to work with wood, just as a musician knows how to play and arrange notes, just as a gardener knows the difference between a peony and a columbine and knows how to prolong the life and blooms of both of them, a writer knows how to craft words in order to fulfill the good purpose of the work. The words that come out of our mouths or that we type onto the page as they occur to us do not come out crafted and polished. I don't care who you are. They don't come out that way. Um, such, are, such results are something we must labor over. Now, I will say that everyone's writing process is different. There are some people who, who perhaps mull these words over and over in their minds so much that when they get them on page, that you know they're you know they're 
pretty good. I'm not one of those people, but um, some of those people, you know, it can come out in, in better form for some people than others, or even in, in, in that can vary from writing um, task to writing task. Um, but they have, you know, they have to be mulled. You have to have uh, practice and there's natural ability and, and all of that. There are lots of variations, but they are still, no matter how good you are when you start, you need to polish and improve as you go along. Um, so we labor over it. That is the difference between speaking in conversation and writing. When we write, the externalized words on the page sit there, begging the writer to polish them, to groom them, to improve them, um, no less than when we get up in the morning and we comb our hair upon rising from bed. One can no more be skilled at writing uh, by virtue of being able to speak a language than a person can be skilled at dancing simply because one can walk. Maybe the dancing is a better analogy than the dribbling. <laughs> so how do we make our words dance? short list. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't a whole semester course. We study the craft. That's what reading is all about, studying the craft. And, and, and not just reading, skimming, but reading, studying, saying, wow, that sentence is amazing. How did he write that sentence? Or what makes this um, phrase work so well? To, to read attentively that way. So we study the craft. We practice. We find our audience. I'll be talking about that more uh, this afternoon. We participate as writers in a writing and reading community. Yeah. <laughs> and we find the place that writing, and for some of us with that publishing, has in our life. It's not just going to happen accidentally. We have to make room for it. So um, Yeah, I was going to say a few more about each of these things. Um, yeah, okay, I will. I will. I'll say a, a few quick things. We're ending at like 10.55 or whatever, something like that. Okay, so uh, just a little bit more about craft. So most of us understand that a child um, who sings a nursery song can't become a skilled musician unless they work on the craft. Uh, most of us understand that the athletic girl cannot become a champion tennis star without working on her skills. But for some reason, and I know I keep repeating this, but for some reason, we just seem to think that the, you know, the world, when it thinks of writing, it imagines like this lone figure sitting there under the tree. This is because of the romantics, um, waiting for the inspiration that pours down on them and the, and the words come out um, and in perfect form. And the first draft is it. I get papers like that. <laughs> no, not here. No, 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 that's not happening. No. Um, but that is a myth, and it, it, it is a lie, actually. Um, and so many of us, but there's a flip side to this. It's not just about me telling you, oh, it's really hard, but it's also me telling you, it's okay that it's hard. <laughs> It's okay if you're not, I mean, there's another sort of definition of writing out there, one of those that gets attributed to everyone that, you know, that, that see, now I'm going to botch that one, but um, that a writer is someone who works at writing, something like that, you know, that if you're working, like the people who work at it are the one, that, that was, someone's going to have to Google that, something like that. But the more you work at your writing, and the harder it is for you, the better, the, the more that you actually are a writer. Um, because we, because you care, that means that that it is a craft to you. So keep working at the craft, keep practicing, um, and yeah. Again, I will say for me, for writing is re for me writing is really hard. Um, it doesn't come easily to me. It requires time, revision, always the existential angst, always. Um, and more revision. And, but I've learned. I've done it enough now that I. I that I know that I can, I just, I trust the process. It's like, I can tell myself, okay, I'm feeling this existential angst right now. Like, it's not going to be good. I can't do it. I can't. And like, I, I know I don't have to pay attention to that. Just keep going. Just keep going. Um, that's for most, you know, some people don't have that. I do. Um, audience, a word about that. And again, I'll expand on some of these points later. You are always writing for an audience and you have to know who your audience is. Um, even if, you know, if you're writing in a journal, it's, it's, for some version of yourself. Um, but if you're writing anything for, no matter how small an audience you are, writing for an audience, and you have to know who they are and how to reach them with your idea, and that, that changes. 
um, from time to time and writing assignment to writing assignment. Uh, and the, yeah, the last point that I was actually going to make for this part is, is this point about community that I've already men mentioned. Writing really is done in community. Um, and I don't mean like having a writing group necessarily, those, those are really good. I just mean in every sense of the word, because if you're reading good words, you're in community. You're putting yourself in the best community by reading the best writing from all of ages past and all of history and all perspectives and all people and all um, experiences. That's a community. And then when you are writing yourself, you need to get feedback on your writing and not from your mother. Uh, <laughs> um, from someone who will give you honest feedback and the you know then often that's an editor editors are amazing i think some of the other workshops today will will talk about that um but for from the actual readers and nothing helps you grow better as a reader is like i'll just th throw out a theoretical example like publishing a piece uh publishing a pro-life essay in the new york times you will get feedback <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, but like that's a dramatic example, but every time I've had something published in a big place or small, the, I choose to learn from the feedback. I choose to think, huh, how could I have avoided that particular criticism that, that could have been avoided? Some, some just can't be avoided. But, um, but you, 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 getting feedback from peers from a community of writers from you know I, I have a community of writers that's over 10 years old and we support one another and we read each other's things if you don't have that kind of community then make it you just you just make it um, and let's see I am not getting through all of my notes but um, yeah some of this I will get into later um, and I guess the final point that I'll make for this part is that um, and I, I was talking with Yes, with you before, before uh, what's your name again? Katie. Katie. Uh, we were talking about this. Uh, there are some people who are full-time writers. That's what they do. Um, most writers are not that. Most writers um, write on the side. Um, you know, people have asked me why I'm not a full-time writer, and, and uh, you know, possibly I could be, I suppose. Um, but for me, like, my writing comes from everything else. It comes from my life. It comes from my teaching. It comes from the, the, the work that I'm doing. And I'll be talking about platform later today, too. And so I would, you know, I would encourage you at this point, wherever you are, to think about writing that comes out of whatever it is that you're doing, um, your work, your school, your life. Um, and if you're one of those who moves ultimately into being a full-time writer because it's because you it's a miracle, um, then, you know, then, 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 give thanks for that miracle but don't set out with that direction just set out that you're going to pursue a life and calling um and if you have words to share about that and those are good words that others want to read um then you will become a writer